you, Albert. Um, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with uh, my distinguished uh, co-presenters, Carolyn and uh, John Luigi. Um, you know, first uh, I need to thank uh, Dermot uh, uh, in the corner doing work, no doubt, uh, for the invitation. Um, and I, I want to congratulate him also on uh, another outstanding event. Uh, this is my third time here. And as I said to uh, Dermot uh, this week and to the uh, minister yesterday, uh, this just gets uh, bigger and better every year. It's uh, quite impressive the way this is developing. And uh, I was just speaking to a lady that had to excuse herself. Um, you know, even being from Canada, where a lot of the things that you're talking about, directives, uh, don't really apply, it really is uh, uh, an intense three or four days of, of uh, heavy duty uh, learning for me. Uh, so there are things that you're doing that are uh, uh, quite remarkable and quite impressive, and uh, I am bene benefiting from, uh, from you uh, tremendously. Um, I think um, some of you, at least, uh, heard my story about Russia, uh, if not yesterday or the day before. Um, and it kind of took the steam out of my presentation, because that's how I was going to start my presentation. Uh, but I'm going to repeat it to you anyways, not the uh, luggage part, but uh, the trip to Russia. About a decade ago, I was invited to Russia to speak to uh, public service executives about uh, procurement fraud. And um, I introduced them to this uh, corruption perception index, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it or seen it. Uh, now, for those that haven't seen it or heard of it, it's extremely complicated and technical. So I'm going to try to explain it the best that I can. And please bear with me. Dark, bad. <laughs> Light, good. <laughs> Did I miss anyone? You're all with me. I'm making a bit of a mockery of it because uh, there's a lot of controversy around this. Uh, it's a perception index, and uh, it really is what people think. Um, one of the uh, components of this uh, corruption index is public procurement. So how public procurement is conducted in a country. So how, um, how clean is the public procurement uh, seen to be in that country? And that contributes to the overall uh, ranking. Uh, you know, there's a, as, as a presenter, I always have this fear, and I'm sure anyone of you who have presented has this fear that uh, some smart, you know what, in the back is going to ask some question that sets you back on your heels. And Well, that's exactly what happened in Russia. I put this up, and some smart, three-letter word, <laughs> in the back launched a torpedo um, that... Uh, you know, it makes you enter that death, death zone of presenters where your heart jumps into your throat, you can feel the blood rushing to your head, <laughs> and you simply don't know how to respond. What this gentleman asked uh, of me was, uh, how can countries, Western countries is what he was saying without saying that specifically, with uh, similar procurement laws and procedures have such uh, such a variety of colors. You'd think that if they're all based similarly, they'd all be similar. And I, I think he was looking at this contrast here, but that's okay. Um, and you know, it was a challenge to explain, so my wife will tell you I'm a terrible liar, so I said, geez, I don't know. I, I just don't know. That's an excellent question. But that question's haunted me in the last decade. Uh, I have to ask myself, how can countries with similar institutional, cultural, and political environments have such disparity in, in their ranking? Um, and it, it's, a, it's a very uh, uh, important question because um, annually, the OECD uh, estimates that on average, uh, governments throughout the world spend $9.5 trillion on public procurement. And uh, two factors influence uh, these expenditures. One is uh, the often opaque nature of public procurement. And let's face it, I don't care what country you're from, it's complicated. Uh, and the second is greed. And that's a human quality that knows no 
sovereign borders. Mm -hmm. And this little figure here is what the OECD estimates is shaved off of public procurement annually worldwide through corruption, bribes, and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not going to comment today uh, on uh, how the procurement process or rules contribute to that $2, two trillion dollar figure. Um, but I will comment on um, the human factor. Uh, and I will do that because we all know that uh, public procurement is one of the rare jobs in public service where a public official is dealing with uh, the private sector open market on a day-to-day -day basis with millions of dollars being exchanged. So there's, there's, uh, there's an issue here of ensuring that people conduct themselves with probity, which is the topic for this afternoon. Um, when I met with my, okay, this isn't turning out the way I should, it should, okay, so, Typical technology, it's not working. Picture this circle, and at the top here uh, is a government bubble, a process bubble, and a, a people bubble, and in the center is effective procurement. Uh, when I uh, made my presentation to the Russians, I, I explained to them that that was the framework that I considered to be the ideal framework, or at least the three essential elements to minimizing corruption. And the top bubble, governance, uh, I won't get into these bubbles, but I explained to them that you know there are things like uh, ensuring um, procurement laws, regulations, and rules were in place. Uh, the second bubble on the other side um, was uh, process and procedures, and this is where uh, um, government has to ensure that uh, procedures are standardized, documented, repeatable, and are known to both the, com the procurement community and the buyers. And then the people component at the bottom, and I explained to them that that requires competent, trained procurement per personnel and knowledgeable buyers. And in both cases, both groups, procurement personnel and buyers, um, dealing with a um, code of conduct. So there's a code of conduct in Canada that applies to both the purchaser and the seller. What I'd like to propose to you today is that this framework and its component parts and this red bubble was supposed to illustrate this, become exponentially more effective as the level of transparency increases. So you can have that framework, but unless you have transparency, I'm not sure that framework is going to be as effective as it could be. Okay, so this is really not working well at all. This gentleman that you can't see, <laughs> he looks like uh, Benjamin Franklin, if you can imagine what Benjamin Franklin looks like. And his name is um, Jeremy Bentham. Those of you who know or studied law probably heard of Jeremy Bentham. Those of you who haven't, I'll explain very quickly who he was. Um, he was um, an 18th century uh, English uh, philosopher, and uh, he was a leading theorist in Anglo-American uh, philosophy of law, and he advocated for such things as separation of church and state and freedom of, freedom of expression. Uh, my reason for introducing you to Mr. Bentham, although you can't see him, uh, is that uh, he was of the view that our propensity as human beings to commit a crime uh, is determined by our perception of the related risk and reward. More importantly, what he pointed out was that uh, the greater the risk of detection, the less likely we are as human beings of violating the law. So if there's a, a chance of detection, if the chance of detection, it'll decrease the probability that someone will break the law. Think about it. I don't know what it's like here in, in Wales, but uh, I see a highway out, out there. Uh, I have a heavy foot, but if I know that there's a radar, a police radar ahead, I'll slow down. Not because I know I'm going to get caught, but because there's a chance that I may get caught. And this theory 
uh, has been proven over and over by researchers over the years. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Everyone know what Halloween is? It is a North American phenomenon. This is uh, in, in North America where kids get dressed in costumes, ghost goblins, and they go door to door to get candy. Well, 18 researchers positioned themselves in homes uh, during Halloween night, and um, as the children came in, I had a little chat with these children, and uh, they said to them, uh, here's a, a bowl of candy, heaping full bowl of candy. Uh, you can only take one. And then the researchers left the room. In half the cases, the, the children were left with a mirror. The other half, they were not. What do you think happened? In the cases with the mirror, the children followed the instruction. They only took one piece of candy. So the mirror acted as a deterrent. Even in cases where the children had masks on, it still acted as a deterrent. The second uh, example I'll give you is what this is all about. Uh, it was a research done at uh, Newca University of Newcastle. You're familiar with it? Yes. Um, researchers looked at uh, the bike theft on campus and they located the three locations on campus with the highest rate of bike theft. And on those, at those locations, they installed a poster with a set of eyes, which is this. This is not Jeremy Bentham. This is my set, next slide. <laughs> and a very simple message. Cycle, thieves, we are watching. Uh, again, what do you think happened at those three locations? A 62% drop in bicycle thefts, just by placing that sign up. So I'm giving you these examples to uh, validate Bentham's uh, theory. The greater the risk of detection, the less likely a person is of violating the law. Okay, so if you're like me, I'm now sitting in the audience saying, okay, what the hell does this have to do with procurement? Right, where are you going with this? Okay, my assertion to you today is that any innovation which increases the transparency of procurement and those involved in it is an innovation in probity. In my view, transparency is a precondition to public procurement probity. So how do we maximize transparency in procurement? Well, I think it's through active and deliberate provision of information. Information on the procurement decision-making process, information about the procurement decisions and their outcomes, and information about those involved in the process. Hopefully this slide is not a problem. Perfect, okay. Uh, so this slide gives you, uh, it is a problem. This is not supposed to be dotted. Okay. <laughs> Whoever procured this software, it's, it's never my fault preparing it. It's always the software. Uh, okay, this slide is supposed to give you a, a very short list of uh, procurement transparency tools. So you can read them for yourself. What I'm going to do is, is pick three or four of them and, and talk about them. I, I'm not going to talk about them all. We heard about e-procurement e this morning and both uh, presenters talked about e-procurement increasing transparency. I won't, I won't touch on that one. Let me start with, uh, these are headlines from an actual Canadian newspaper. Um, one of the most precarious situations in public procurement is the potential uh, for decision makers to be swayed by firms uh, so as to obtain uh, contract insight or preferential treatment. This is lobbying. Uh, I'm not suggesting lobbying uh, shouldn't occur. In a capitalist society, I think uh, lobbying is inevitable and I think it has a, a healthy place. But it, it can also have negative impacts. Uh, it can taint government decisions and uh, it can debase the public procurement process and those who, who work in it. Um, this is why I believe lobbying registration needs to be mandatory. So if in any country, if you have lobbyists, I think they should be registered. And more importantly, their activities need to be registered. Um, so that everyone knows who lobbied who. And in these headlines, you can see in Canada, that's what we do. Even the prime minister was lobbied. And we know if, if you go into a specific website, you can see who the Prime Minister talked to on which days. 
No idea what they talked about, but you know that he's been lobbied. So the challenge uh, is to ensure um, that it doesn't occur in back rooms in secrecy. Um, the lobbying needs to be done openly, and people need to know, um, um, and need to, it needs to be transparent to everyone. Okay, this is an actual letter. You can see my name on it. Um, and the reason I, I, I bring this up to you is because um, I, I read a book called Corruption and Money Laundering, A Symbiotic Relationship. I'm sure some of the experts in this room have heard of it. It's been written by David Chaikin and uh, J.C. Sherman. And these two authors suggest that the single most important preventative tool for combating corruption is the registering of public officials' assets and income. So this is a letter that's sent to me annually, or sent to all public uh, um, uh, officials in Canada annually in March, and they basically ask, what, your, what are your assets and what is your, what is your income? And in case you think this is a paper exercise, I was sitting at that chair about two over from Dermot the other day, and my Blackberry went off, if I can find it, it rattled, and I'll read to you an email that I got from, the, uh, from this office. They do their homework. So it says, Hello, Mr. Brunetta. I hope uh, this email, email finds you well. I am writing to follow up on your annual review under the Conflict of Interest Act. Your correspondence was received March 13th. Thank you for your submission. I noticed that your residence located at 163 Echo Drive was conditionally sold in April 2014. Would you be so kind as to confirm whether this transaction was completed? and whether the monies from the transaction were reinvested. I forgot. We sold our home in April, and they didn't forget. So in, in, in Canada, there's very close monitoring of um, our assets and our income. Now in Canada, this is kept confidential, and I think this is, uh, if you do any reading on this subject, the, uh, the controversy here is whether it should be uh, uh, maintain confidential like it is in Canada, or whether it should be publicly um, made available. And the OECD, or no, I'm sorry, the World Bank uh, did a, a survey in 2009 and found that of the 175 countries they surveyed, only one third made these disclosures public. Oh, five, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Okay, fairness monitors. I'm not sure if anyone here has heard of fairness monitors. Uh, I was actually responsible for putting this program in place in, in, in Canada in my previous job. And uh, these are independent third parties uh, that monitor all or part of a procurement process. And what they're looking for uh, in, in observing a process, uh, they're looking to provide an opinion on procedural fairness. Uh, is the process that the entity is undertaking uh, fairly and equitably designed, and is it being executed that way? They're looking for substantive fairness, uh, looking as to whether the terms of the solicitation and the evaluation are equitably designed and executed. And finally, fairness of treatment. Are all participants in the solicitation being um, treated equally and equitably? Uh, the uh, fairness monitor is not accountable to anyone involved in the procurement. Uh, uh, they report uh, independently to someone uh, outside of the procurement process. Uh, they have authority to raise issues in real time. So if they're observing something in the procurement process, they can say, wait, if you continue down that path, I'm going to have to give you a reserved uh, opinion. Um, so most people, the vast majority, will make the adjustment the Fairness Monitor uh, suggests. Um, the uh, final report, their opinion is uh, public, is uh, made public. They issue a report, and uh, it's available to anyone. So these are actual covers of uh, samples that I picked off the uh, website. Um, public reporting of contracts. Now, I'm not going to get into the data integrity. Uh, I know the U.S. data integrity issues. I, that's not what I'm uh, going to talk about. But what I'm going to talk about here is. Um, public reporting of contracts. I have not seen a country do it as well as the United States. Uh, you can go on the United States website and basically dissect the procurement down to the local level. Uh, it's something that uh, I've been suggesting to the Canadian government, like it, it's in this day and age, we heard about uh, uh, 
open data the other day, two, three days ago. In the day and age of open data, there is no reason at all why, uh, why all governments cannot produce uh, procurement data of this type, or at least contracting data. Okay, I must, I must be low on time now. Whistleblowers. This poor guy is our former Prime Minister, uh, Paul Martin. Um, for those of you who don't know what whistleblowers are, uh, it's a tool uh, in Canada, it's actual law, that allows officials, employees, and citizens to report instances of uh, ethical misconduct, waste, fraud, uh, without the fear of retribution. Um, these, help, these laws actually help uh, inappropriate behavior um, to be uh, reported. In Canada, as you can see from the screen, it was a whistleblower that revealed uh, the procurement scandal in 2005. It was called the sponsorship scandal. And it, it uncovered uh, millions, millions of dollars worth of um, illegal contracts being um, pushed uh, out the door. Uh, it triggered a firestorm of media coverage, uh, criminal charges, and uh, um, as I mentioned, the fall of the government. Whistleblowers. Access to information. Along with the whistleblower provision, oh, this is not going to work because my quote is underneath this pile of paper. I'll have to read it to you. Um, whistleblower provision and access to information. Now, this is uh, legislation I, I believe everyone, except Italy, uh, has some sort of uh, access to information uh, legislation. This provides citizens with the right to know. So if you want to know what's going on, you file an access to information request and you get the information. In Canada, it excludes uh, proprietary information. So if there's um, industry um, sensitive information, you will not get that. But you will get, for example, the procurement process. How was it conducted? You'll get that information. While the last two tools that I mentioned, whistleblower and access information, are fairly common in most of our countries, uh, they are in themselves, I don't believe, uh, um, effective unless there's pub public scrutiny and awareness. And this is where a vibrant civil society and a media, uh, vibrant media, uh, become uh, critical conduits to effective transparency. Now, I know there's some uh, folks from the uh, government in the room. Uh, I know from my, early in my career, we hated media. We hated journalists. Uh, we avoided them. Uh, but in, in terms of transparency and procurement, they play a vital role uh, in our democracies. Um, so uh, over the years, as I started losing hair, I realized that uh, they, they, they are part of the system and they're an effective part of the system. Uh, we have to use them. So the quote that you see behind, that you can barely see behind the paper is uh, by Mark Twain, an American humorist. And you're testing my memory. That's when you get that sinking feeling that I was describing <laughs> earlier. I don't, it said something like, um, there are only two Two things that can shed light in this world. Uh, the force of the sun, how appropriate, we had an eclipse today, and the Associated Press. Okay, I'm almost done, Albert. Uh, now I'm supposed to show this quick video. The last thing I wanna sh show you is a video in my office because I think we are a transparency tool in Canada. And again, we have to uh, adjust the technology to make this happen. So this is a video that was produced and is on our website to inform suppliers of what we do. And it's not going to work either. Oh, it will work. Okay. <laughs> So there it is. You're motivated. You decided to do it. You finally bid on a contract offered by a federal department or agency. After the evaluation period, the contract is awarded. But not to you. Yet, you feel the contract was not properly awarded? Hmm. What are your options to deal with this situation? Let's see. First, you can try to have a discussion with the department. Second, you can consider going to court. Or you can simply forget it, chalk it up to experience, and move on. Well, not anymore. Because another option is available to you. The Office of the Procurement Ombudsman. The Office of what? 
You say, the Office of the Procurement Ombudsman, or OPO for short. OPO is a neutral and independent organization created precisely to help businesses that have contractual issues with the federal government. OPO can help you address a contracting problem by reviewing the complaint about the award or administration of a contract, help you reestablish a positive and productive dialogue with the government department, and it can even help resolve a contract dispute thanks to its dispute resolution services. Is this the one solution you didn't think of? Now go. Don't waste any more time moping or questioning yourself. There is now another option offered to you. Okay, now let's summarize. If you have an issue regarding a federal contract, you should consult the Office of the Procurement Ombudsman, a team of professionals who can listen and help you. Is this not something you should do? Well, yes, of course it is. Even more so, because OPO services are free of charge. So no more hesitation. For any issues relating to a federal contract, call the Office of the Procurement Ombudsman. We're here to help. I have one more slide and then I, I'm done, Albert. I am terribly sorry for going over time. So I'm going to leave you with uh, a quote from Jeremy Bentham, and, and hopefully it works, because everything else has been a disaster. <laughs> I think this summarizes my presentation, and I'll leave you with that. Thank you. <laughs>